Few scientific issues are as hotly debated as the issue of global warming. While the vast majority of climate scientists warn that global warming poses a real and significant threat to our future, there are dissenters who claim the threat is overblown, or even that the entire idea is an elaborate hoax. If you're not an expert yourself, how can you decide who to believe? In this presentation, I'll explain the basic science behind global warming and address the major issues raised by skeptics with the aim of helping you develop your own informed opinion. At the most basic level, concern about global warming arises from two simple claims. The first claim is that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, by which we mean a gas that traps heat and makes a planet warmer than it would be otherwise. The second claim is that human use of fossil fuels, by which we mean coal, oil, and natural gas, is adding more of the heat-trapping gas to Earth's atmosphere. You can probably see that if both these claims are true, then we should expect global warming to be a consequence. So before we turn to the question of how concerned we should be about this warming, let's investigate the evidence behind these claims. In fact, there is no serious debate about the first claim, which is based on the well-understood mechanism of what we call the greenhouse effect. This diagram shows how it works. In brief, there's always a balance between the amount of energy a planet's surface absorbs from sunlight and the amount it returns to space as infrared light, a form of light that our eyes cannot see. Greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide slow the escape of this infrared light and thereby keep a planet warmer than it would be otherwise, in much the same way that a blanket keeps you warmer by slowing the escape of your body heat. Just as more blankets will keep you even warmer, more greenhouse gas molecules mean a warmer Earth. In case you're wondering how we know that greenhouse gases really trap heat this way, the answer is twofold. First, scientists can measure the heat trapping effects in the laboratory. Such measurements were first made more than 150 years ago and have been repeated and refined ever since. Second, we can easily confirm the importance of the greenhouse effect to planetary temperatures. A simple formula allows us to calculate the temperature any planet would have without greenhouse gases because it depends only on the planet's distance from the sun and the relative proportions of sunlight that the planet absorbs and reflects. The calculation shows that without greenhouse gases, Earth's average temperature would be well below freezing. In other words, we need the greenhouse effect to explain Earth's actual temperature. The same is true for all the other planets. We get correct answers for planetary temperatures only when we include the greenhouse effect, which brings us to an important point. Without the naturally occurring greenhouse effect, Earth would be too cold for liquid oceans and life as we know it. In other words, the naturally occurring greenhouse effect is a very good thing. But now consider the planet Venus. Venus has almost 200,000 times as much carbon dioxide in its atmosphere as Earth, which creates a greenhouse effect so strong that the entire surface is baked hotter than a pizza oven providing clear proof that it is possible to have too much of a good thing. In fact, the first claim is so clearly true that the only argument you'll hear against it is that it is incomplete and that for Earth, water vapor plays a larger role than carbon dioxide in setting the temperature. This argument begins with a grain of truth. Like carbon dioxide, water vapor is a greenhouse gas, and because it is 10 times as abundant as carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere, water vapor does indeed contribute more to Earth's overall greenhouse warming. However, unlike carbon dioxide, water vapor moves rapidly in and out of the atmosphere through evaporation and rain and snow, and the amount of water vapor therefore self-regulates in response to the temperature of the ocean and atmosphere. The result is that water vapor serves only to amplify climate changes caused by other factors. For example, if more carbon dioxide raises the global temperature, the atmosphere can then hold more water vapor, which makes the temperature rise even more. So again, we're brought back to the same bottom line for claim one. There is simply no doubt that carbon dioxide traps heat and that more carbon dioxide tends to make Earth warmer than it would be otherwise. We now turn to the second basic claim, that human use of fossil fuels is adding carbon dioxide to Earth's atmosphere. This claim is also easy to verify, because scientists have been measuring the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide since the late 1950s. This graph shows the data. Notice that there are seasonal wiggles, but the overall trend is upward, leaving no doubt that the carbon dioxide concentration is rapidly rising. 
Moreover, scientists can reconstruct Earth's carbon dioxide concentration over the past 800,000 years by studying air bubbles trapped in ancient ice. This graph shows the data from these ice core studies, along with the more recent direct measurements. Notice that while the carbon dioxide concentration has varied naturally, today's level is some 40% higher than the highest level in at least the last 800,000 years. If the upward trend continues at its current rate, the concentration will reach double the pre-industrial value only about 50 to 60 years from now and triple by the middle of the next century. The only way to escape the conclusion that we are dramatically increasing the concentration of heat-trapping carbon dioxide is to claim that the rise is somehow natural rather than human-caused. But scientists can check this too, because carbon dioxide released from fossil fuel burning is slightly different in its characteristics, more specifically in its isotope ratios, than other carbon dioxide found in the atmosphere. Measurements confirm that the rising carbon dioxide concentration is coming from the use of fossil fuels and not from non-human sources. The final verdict? There is no doubt about the validity of claim 2, either. Having verified both of the key claims, we can now treat them as facts and revisit the original argument. Because carbon dioxide traps heat, and we are adding more of it to the atmosphere, we should expect global warming as a consequence. So how is it that you can turn on the news and find people debating the reality of global warming? In fact, most of these people are not scientists, and I can't really explain why they are so willing to ignore the basic science we have discussed. However, there are some serious scientists among these skeptics, and we cannot simply dismiss their views. So what is it that they say? I won't claim to be an expert on all of their views, but these scientific skeptics generally do not dispute either of our two basic facts, nor do they dispute the conclusion that we expect global warming to occur if we continue adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Rather, they argue either that the problem is not imminent or that the consequences will not be that bad, and therefore that the concerns expressed by the vast majority of climate scientists are overblown. The truth is, it is possible that these skeptics are right. Earth's climate is very complex, which means that there are many uncertainties in attempts to predict the rate and consequences of future global warming. Still, there's a reason why these skeptics are a small minority in the scientific community, and it's because the evidence to date does not support their views. Consider the possibility that global warming will take much longer or not be as severe as most scientists expect. For this to be true, the skeptics generally claim that other scientists are not taking into account feedbacks that can counter the warming trend. But if such unaccounted for feedbacks exist, we ought to see evidence for them in the data about global warming to date. Direct measurements from which we can infer global temperature go back to about 1880, though there are greater uncertainties for the earlier years. This graph shows the data. Notice the clear upward trend, which is consistent with the expected global warming and does not indicate any major counteracting feedbacks. We can also look at the feedback question by comparing the rise in temperature with the rise in carbon dioxide. The green curve shows the rising carbon dioxide concentration, and the blue curve shows temperature plotted as what we call a five-year running mean. That is, instead of plotting temperatures for individual years, which show significant natural variability, each value on this curve represents the average for the previous five years. Notice the close correlation, which is the opposite of what we would expect if there were major feedbacks acting to stop global warming. Incidentally, in case you've heard the claim that global warming has stopped in the past 15 years, take a good look at the data. This graph goes only to 2010, but I've used NOAA's data to calculate the values out through 2013. And the fact is that while the rate of temperature increase has slowed somewhat, the last 15 years have been the hottest 15-year period on record, the last 10 years have been the hottest 10-year period, and the last 5 years have been the hottest 5-year period. That hardly sounds like a problem that is over. Another approach to the feedback issue is to look at the ice core climate record. Here, we see the same carbon dioxide data that we looked at earlier, but this time with the temperature record as well. In this 800,000 year record, the ups and downs you see are the natural cycles of ice ages and warm periods, which are triggered by subtle changes in Earth's orbit and axis tilt. The close correlation between the temperatures and carbon dioxide level, along with the rapid speed with which the cycles begin and end, tell us that once a cycle is triggered, it is driven by changes in the carbon dioxide concentration. 
Moreover, in some cases, a 50% rise in the carbon dioxide concentration led to a temperature rise of more than 8 degrees Celsius or 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Fortunately, most climate models predict a more modest temperature rise from current global warming, even though we are on track to reach a 100% increase from the pre-industrial carbon dioxide concentration within the next 50 years or so. Nevertheless, the point should be clear. The past climate data do not give us any reason to think that natural feedbacks will mitigate the warming. And that brings us to the topic of climate models, which are attempts to simulate Earth's climate on a computer. While models may always have uncertainties, today's models can simulate the past climate remarkably well. Notice the close agreement on this graph between the black curve showing actual temperature data and the red curve showing the predictions of today's best climate models. In contrast, the blue curve shows what models predict if we leave out the human contribution through the use of fossil fuels. While it agrees with data for times before about 1930, it fails after that. These models strongly suggest not only that recent warming is traceable to human activity, but also that we should have at least a fair degree of confidence in what the models predict for the future. And while different models differ in their precise predictions, they all agree that global warming will be real and substantial. Between the data I've shown and the models, you can see why I don't put much stock in the skeptic claims that global warming isn't imminent. So now we turn to the second common skeptic claim, that the consequences of global warming won't be that bad. So what are the expected consequences? First, note that even a relatively small change in the global average temperature can mean much larger regional changes, which is why many scientists prefer the term climate change to global warming. This short video shows the regional temperature changes that have occurred since 1880. Watch carefully and look at where you live on the map. If you extrapolate the trend for another 50 years or another 100 years, are you comfortable with the result? Also, remember that temperature is not the only thing changing. Rain and snowfall patterns also change and many scientists suspect that such changes are behind at least some recent floods, droughts, and increases in wildfires. Moreover, because plants and animals are adapted to local conditions, climate changes can disrupt ecosystems and agriculture, leading many scientists to worry that climate change will hurt our ability to grow enough food for a growing population, reduce our supply of fresh water, encourage the spread of disease, and more. A second major consequence of global warming is that we expect more extreme weather events. The reason is that a rise in global temperature means there is more total energy in the atmosphere, and it is this energy that drives weather. We therefore expect storms such as hurricanes, thunderstorms, and tornadoes to become either more numerous, more severe, or both. The same applies to heat waves and even to severe winter weather, leading to the ironic result that global warming may have played a role in the severe winter experienced this year across much of the United States. A third consequence is a rise in sea level. Although we don't usually notice it, water actually expands slightly as it gets warmer. This thermal expansion effect has already caused sea level to rise about 20 centimeters over the past century and is expected to cause a rise of another 30 centimeters or one foot by 2100. While that may not sound like much, it will flood some low-lying regions and cause storm surges like those that occurred with Hurricane Sandy to be much larger. Far worse, global warming is slowly melting Earth's ice caps. Scientists have a hard time predicting how rapidly ice will melt in the future, but it is very likely that melting ice will cause sea level to rise by at least a meter during this century, and we can't rule out the possibility of a rise of several meters. This rise could be devastating to hundreds of millions of people around the world. For example, the red on this map shows coastal regions of the southeastern United States that would be flooded by a 1 meter rise in sea level, and the yellow shows regions flooded by a 6 meter rise. And if you really want to understand the long-term threat, consider the fact that if the ice caps completely melted, sea level would rise by more than 70 meters, or 240 feet. Although this worst-case scenario would probably require many centuries or more to unfold, it raises the dismaying possibility that our descendants would need deep-sea diving equipment to visit the remains of today's coastal communities. The fourth and last major consequence that we'll discuss is called ocean acidification. The increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide also means that more carbon dioxide dissolves in the oceans, where it makes the water more acidic. 
This ocean acidification is already killing many coral reefs and may be contributing to the decline of fisheries upon which millions of people depend for livelihood and food. It also raises an important issue for those who ponder so-called geoengineering schemes to counter global warming. Most of the proposed schemes aim to cool Earth with such things as particles in the atmosphere or mirrors that would reflect sunlight, but they wouldn't actually lower the carbon dioxide concentration. This means that while they might alleviate warming, they would not solve the problem of ocean acidification. The bottom line is that there is no serious scientific debate over the reality of global warming, and while there are uncertainties in the precise consequences and how rapidly they will unfold, there is a clear potential for great damage to our civilization. Viewed in this light, the skeptic argument against action asks us to place a very risky bet. Moreover, the skeptic position makes us sound rather helpless in light of a potential threat, but I do not believe this is the case. After all, there's no magic to solving this problem. We simply need a way to get energy from sources other than fossil fuels. In fact, if we were serious about this, we could do it already with a combination of renewable sources and nuclear power. There are also many promising energy technologies on the horizon including biofuels, solar power from space, and nuclear fusion using water as fuel. The problem of global warming is eminently solvable if we are just willing to make a little effort. Indeed, my own opinion is that the free market would rapidly solve the problem if we simply stopped socializing the many hidden costs of fossil fuels, which include hundreds of billions of dollars each year in pollution-related health costs, the military cost of protecting the oil supply, the costs associated with terrorism and totalitarian regimes fueled by oil revenues, the environmental damage from oil spills and strip mining for coal, and the consequences of global warming. To me, these costs speak to the clear need for a carbon tax that will stop the socialization and instead charge these costs to the people who use the fuels. I believe this would level the playing field for alternative fuels, allowing the market to choose the best energy sources for the future. Of course, that's just my opinion, and you may have your own ideas about how to solve the problem of global warming. The only real question is how much effort you are willing to make. To help you decide, I suggest you take the letter to your grandchildren test. On average, no matter what age you are, your grandchildren will be your current age in about 50 to 60 years. For example, if you are a grandparent today, in 50 years your grandchildren are likely to be grandparents themselves. And if you are in high school today, 50 years from now you will be old enough to have grandchildren in high school. So imagine writing a letter and placing it in a time capsule for your grandchildren to read in 50 years, telling them what you did or did not do to help alleviate the threat of global warming and why. Then ask yourself, how will they feel about the decisions you made? I hope you found this presentation useful and encourage you to share it with others. As H.G. Wells wrote almost a hundred years ago, human history becomes more and more a race between education and catastrophe, and the issue of global warming makes a perfect case in point. With the evidence we have today, there's simply no excuse for a failure to act, and it is up to all of us to help those who don't yet understand why.